Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Boom session this evening. My name is Scott Morrison, the host, uh, and I run a business called The Boom. We help unblock, unlock, and unleash commercial, creative, and cultural impact in people, teams, and businesses. And welcome as well to Restore Fora's five-day festival celebrating mind, body, and soul. We're here at Fora Borough, beautiful surroundings, and here they definitely know that happy, healthy people deliver their best work. And we're great, it's just great environment, great to be here. We're looking forward to today's session. And my background is in agency and clients, and these boom sessions are really geared to helping you listen to, learn from, understand the challenges about, and really get under the skin of people who I really believe are creating the future that they want to see and really disrupting the industries that they're in. It's fantastic that today I'm very, very uh, Honoured to have the brilliant uh, and amazing Josh, uh, Josh, Krzyzewski, Josh Krzyzewski, who is the global CEO of Mediacom. And as the global CEO, uh, Josh is leading the transformation of the agency's product, strategy and structure to be digital first and consultancy driven. He oversees several big global clients, as well as the agency's new business and marketing efforts. Josh is also, if that's not enough, the CEO of EMEA, overseeing 4,000 people across 37 offices. This is such a great, it's a great roll call. Yeah. Um, and he's driving the vision and the culture for the region. And previously, Josh was the CEO of Mediacom UK, and I worked very closely with him on that, uh, which is the country's number one media agency, uh, billing over £1.8 billion across six offices. This is incredible. Um, not only that, Josh has also got a background in the creative industry, in the creative uh, agencies and he worked at St Luke's in the early 2000s and also ran his own digital agency called K-Word. Correct? K-Word? Right, yeah, 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 K-Word. Yeah, K -word. K -word. Wonderful. So today we are going to, and it's perfectly aligned for the Restore Week, we are going to be talking about the future of mental wellness in the workplace because Josh has been leading an incredible revolution in this. I've worked very closely with him on some of the stuff that he's been doing and I've been watching it with absolute, uh, just, just awe at the scale of the ambition that Josh has been working in. So tonight, we're gonna to be speaking to Josh. Welcome, Josh. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much for coming in. Thank you, thanks. That was lovely. Lovely to hear all of that. <laughs> I have to tell you, you did give me a promotion just then. Oh, sorry. Because you called me the global CEO and I'm the global CEO. Ah, oh, global CEO. And the Amir CEO. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. But no, I, I enjoyed it. Letters, I sort of felt like, should I say anything? Or should I just enjoy it? <laughs> Take that promotion. But so I'd say, it, well. say in case somebody else picks up on it. <laughs> uh, Josh, it's great, great to have you here. And it's always, and you are such a, like a smiley, uh, wonderful presence to be around and it just it, it's so refreshing because you've not only just taken on all these incredible roles you know this is the big role that you're doing now um, and you're you're sort of still finding time to find the joy in life and bring all this uh, brilliance with you what's what's changed for you in the roles that you're doing but also fundamentally what's changed in the light of covid in your industry and in your business i mean i think um I think from, um, so I, look, I try to enjoy everything I do. Well, no, I try, I, I make a point of enjoying everything that I do. I think um, life's too short and, and you know, every, every role that you do is defined by, by you, you know, by, by the person who's doing that job. And so I always try to bring, you know, humor and, uh, uh, you know, in, just to try, in, try to enjoy things with the people that are around me. So, um, but yeah, I get scared by things as well. And uh, and uh, I always, you know, there's always a combina sort of a combination of fear and joy in, in my life generally. <laughs> I'd say um, what's changed um, what's changed recently with COVID. Um, lots of things, you know. I think um, I think we're in a time where it's quite difficult to answer anything, or like answer any question with a singular answer because you know everything's just so multi-varied at the moment you know if you if someone asks me how are you you know I could yeah. say well I'm happy and I'm sad yeah and I'm anxious and I'm calm yeah. and I'm everything you know and and I think everyone feels like that a bit a bit really and I think um if the, I spent I was having I was having dinner with a friend the other night and we were sort of talking about how people don't feel like there's so much in their flow at the moment like there's usually we have a flow and I just think it, everything feels a bit jolted right now. And, yeah. and, and I think that's been a thing that, you know, 
it's not insurmountable, but I definitely think that is a bit of a vibe at the moment yeah. with COVID. If that answers the question. Uh, yeah, it does. I, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I, what I've always admired about the culture, let's talk about media comment, like the culture that, that, that's always been there, but you've absolutely lived and breathed and added to is the idea of like people first. Yeah. How does that, you know, how does it feel being so responsible for so many people with so much change and everybody going through this thing that we've just talked about? It feels very staccato and what does it feel like to be I've, leading that? It's, it, I think, look, it's, it's um, any leadership position is always a privilege, I would say. You know, as a leader, you're there to serve the people. So you're there uh, and not the other way around. And so I think, you know, I feel a responsibility, definitely. Um, People first, better results is, is our mantra, as you said. Um, it's not something we just put on the wall and forget about. It's absolutely kind of fundamental it's definitely lived. DNA of the, of the company. And yeah. I think as leaders, we sort of put our own spin on it and we evolve it. So my focus on it when I was running the UK, I definitely sort of focused more on well-being and wellness and mental health. And I'm sort of, we'll talk about how you know, how I want to establish that across the world now. You know, my, my global COO role only started a couple of months ago, so it's quite fresh, but I've definitely got a lot of ambition around how we try and um, focus a lot more globally on mental health specifically. Um, you know, our pe how are our people right now? They're like I am, you know, they are a combination of things. Uh, in the same, you know, we've got 8,000 people globally um, but it would be the same if I was running a team of eight people. I think mm. you know, everyone would be feeling a combination of things right now. Yeah. And we're trying to establish uh, kind of a new working model that is that's, you know, going to be incredibly exciting for people in the future. Because I think we're, we're at a really weird time right now. I think the, the, the short-term effects of COVID have been... Um, in the main, really quite tough for people. I think, you know, people have lost their jobs. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, people have lost their lives. Yeah. Um, there's been a, an overall feeling of uncertainty and, uh, we, you know, there still is, you know, we're, we're not, it, we're, it's not, it's not over. Um, and that creates anxiety and stress and um, that's a really difficult thing. And, in, uh, but at the same time, it's created accelerated transformation in business as a whole, including our business. And so I think we've kind of changed. I mean, so much has changed in the last um, six months in terms of our, you know, how, we're, how we're working with each other, how we're using technology, how we're structured, how we're defining our products, how those products interface with each other, how we're working with our clients, the, relate, the depth of the relationships that we've got with our clients, how we pitch for new business, how we talk to each other, like everything. It's just happens it's so rapidly. And, and I think that whilst that's quite, um, you know, it's quite a difficult thing for everyone to deal with when we've got day jobs going on at the same time, I think we're setting ourselves up for a really exciting future. And um, I feel really optimistic and positive about that. Brilliant. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think the groundwork for a lot of that is businesses like yours like so four have been doing restore for a long time now and, and the idea of wellness within the organization feels like now it feels like it's a, a given you know by a lot of organizations and certainly now in covid you know and what's happening people are like yeah we need to get our wellness programs and everything else but when you started your wellness revolution at mediacom and i and i remember and i actually remember working in other businesses where and at that time it it, it was kind of talked about as a it may have just sat in an hr function mm. it may have just been a we'll do a meditation day <laughs> you know it, it was very trite and very but let's go back to kind of how you started that revolution and create that kind of the future of, of of that at mediacom what what was going on at the time what was i think listen i think it's cut, partly came from a person my own personal experience uh, of of life yeah um and it also sort of came from a working in an industry that is, you know, the media industry is quite a tough um, work hard, play hard, traditionally quite work hard, play hard, um, uh, you know, game face, all that stuff, um, culture. And Mediacom is a business that, although people first better results is absolutely our mantra and we've, we've always really invested our people. It's a highly competitive, high performance, very domineering, um, driver culture 
Mm. And what I mean by that is the people at the top of the business have all, are always are drivers. They're people who, who get stuff done, who have kind of short attention span and, um, you know, who have high expectations, yeah, and are quite loud. And, 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 and I was very conscious of that. And by the way, I'm a bit like that myself, <laughs> you know, if I'm really honest. And, I, and so, you know, and that's probably why I've done, done okay in the business. But I was also quite cognizant that, A, there's a lots of very talented people around me who aren't like that. Um, and B, my experience of life is one whereby I feel like it's impossible um, to switch off from work. And um, particularly when you're in a highly competitive industry and a highly competitive business, um, you could, th there's fear of failure and there's kind of um, all those kind of, you get those negative uh, voices in your head and um, you feel like you always have to be working and you've got a mobile phone that's, that's always buzzing and it's, it's very difficult to escape from, from that. And, and I, my personal experience is that um, I struggle with insomnia right. um, when I am working too hard, if yeah. I'm honest. I mean, that's the best way of putting it. I've never really put it that way. But honestly, I find that, that, that if, I'm, if I'm going at 100 miles an hour during the day and I'm not having any breaks and I'm not looking after myself effectively, yeah. I don't really sleep very well at night and I find myself waking up in the middle of the night and I, and I struggle to get back to sleep, sleep and I ruminate and I don't have particularly helpful thinking and, and all of those things I think are down to not focusing on wellness and well-being and looking after myself personally. So I wanted to, when I took over as CEO of uh, the UK, Medicom UK, I really wanted to instill a culture where we talked about looking after each other, ourselves and each other, where we, as a business, looked after our people, but also where we, um, where we gave our people the tools to be able to look after themselves and be resilient themselves um, day to day. So that was kind of like my focus from, from day one. Um, it was like the thing I'd already decided before I got the job, that when I got the job, that's what I was going to do. And I said, I really set off on a mission on that. And it wasn't really about mental health. It was more just about looking after yourself. And then it evolved over time. Right. Yeah, that's Is that a really long answer. No, no, no. It, it, it's great because it's the, the way that we the way that we do the, the, the discussion, the kind of conversation, we have a little bit of a structure to it. Uh, and uh, the, the simple structure is on block, on lock, on leash. And, what, what I'm really fascinated about is that the operating system for the boom is unblock, unblock old thinking, unblock old ways of working, stuff that's no use, unlock new inspiration, new thinking, and unleash with action. And so whenever we're trying to change the future and create the future we want to see, we go through these three processes. So I, I'm always keen to understand, whenever we start to think new, there are hundreds of blockers yeah. that sometimes sit in our way. And people out there who, who want to be um, creating new stuff and want to be doing something in wellness with their organisation, they're likely to come up with some blockers too, but what were the blockers that you faced in the organisation when you started rolling this out? So I feel like the blockers were partly blockers in my own head. So self-doubt, um, you know, the feeling that you're trying to change something that has been a reason for the success of this business. Mm. So is that really a sensible thing to do? Um, and then I think... Um, maybe embarrassment a bit as well, that, you're, that, that I would be talking to people about something that is just a bit alien to them and, and so right. maybe wouldn't be welcome. So I think that was, what, I think that was part, so a bit of kind of self-doubt, really. Well, that's interesting, just on the embarrassment. Is the embarrassment your embarrassment or do you think the organisation's embarrassment as well, maybe, that they hadn't, that we hadn't talked about it or it, wasn't, it was still relatively taboo or...? I think more my embarrassment, right. if I'm really <laughs> honest. <laughs> I, I think That's good just, to be clear on. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, I think it, I think it was, um, you know, it's, it's like sometimes, sometimes you talk, when, you, when you're really, to, you know, I think it's really important for leaders to be complete, you know, we talk about authenticity and mm. showing your vulnerable side. And, you know, I think it's widely recognised that those are good things in leaders yeah, these absolutely. days. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. But I think that when you do it for the first time, it's quite scary because you yeah, think people yeah. might judge you and you think people might think you're weak or you know that you're not equipped to be doing the job that you're doing because you're weak and and so i think there's a bit of that um but then also i think there is an established culture in our industry that was a blocker mm. uh, and um i think 
the truth is, blockers in these things are always in your head. They're never a rea the reality. And the rea you know, the way that we think about things is never a reality. It's just the way that we think about things. So my reality is different from your reality. Yeah. Even just sitting here, we're experiencing something. Even though it seems like, you know, we're, we're really aligned, we're philosophically aligned, <laughs> you know, we get on. Yeah. Our experience of right now will be different because yes. we're two different people. Yeah. And, and I think that that's um, quite a profound re truth in everything. And, you know, we can talk a bit about resilience and we can talk a bit about um, mental health. And, but I think having that profound understanding of, of um, human experience and thought, the relationship between thinking and feeling are really fundamental things to um, well-being, actually. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love actually um, Jamie, Sm I think it's Jamie Smart, a guy who's written the book Clarity, he talks about, uh, I mean, it's, it's a kind of a classic uh, uh, sort of neuro neuroscientific thing anyway, but, but the, the, the reality between, you know, what, what your reality is and the thoughts and feelings and what that creates and actually, once I think once you get to understand that a little bit more, it can really change how you see things and how you definitely do things. And yeah, I think there's some really simple truths in all of that that we forget about because the, the reality is painted by what you see right in front of you. Quite, you know, it's like and if the culture is, I mean, my own personal experience when I was in advertising many many years yeah. ago, um, and actually subsequently through my life, I've suffered from bouts of depression and and manage it in various different ways. But I know when I'm having those bouts of, of depression, it's because I'm driven by kind of my thoughts and feelings projecting this reality. And it's only when I sort of sit back and go, actually, how much of this is real? Like, are, are people really thinking that about what I'm doing? No. <laughs> Am I really not doing the sort of stuff that, well, you are doing what you really want to do. And it's when you can just take that sense check and be able to go, right, no, the reality isn't that at all, that it kind of steadies you again and helps you, and it kind of works through those blockers. Yeah. But what I'm interested in is the industry kind of thing is, yeah. is, is really what interests me, because I found it very hard sometimes to, to make that difference between the reality and perception in the industry, and it feels like it's a bit of a blocker for a lot of people and asking for help. Yeah, I think, well, can I just ask you a question? Please, yeah, 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 do. So, I mean, I loved what you just said there. It was really, I, I, you know, and you, the, share, the fact that you shared it, but... Um, you know, you talk about, but what, what, what's the, uh, what, what, what's your framework is unblock? Unblock, unlock, unleash. Unlock, unleash, yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and I really like that, but I think that there's something that you just said that was very interesting, which is that you su you've suffered from bouts of depression. It comes back, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, these things come back. Yeah, and, you know, and I just talked about the fact that I, un uh, you know, that I understand that um, reality is different from thinking, yeah. yeah. But I don't always understand that. I yeah, constantly yeah. forget that. <laughs> Constantly, and then I have yeah. to re remind myself it. And sometimes, like it takes me a long time to it. Like it can be months for me yes. to re remind myself that. And yeah. in that time that I'm not remembering it, I'm giving oxygen to unhelpful thinking. Absolutely. Again and again and again and again. Yeah. That is the biggest block in the world. Yes. Yeah. And I think that so in answer to your question, you know, most my, you know me talking about the industry being a block. That's just, that was just a reality I've made up in my head because of my experience <laughs> of certain people in the industry or how we talk about ourselves in an industry. Yes. Actually, as soon as you want to stand for something and you want the industry to listen and behave differently, you need to stand up and say that thing. Yeah, you are. You and, and, and then right. they will, and, and we're all talking about lovely human beings who are compassionate and who care and who, you know, who want to have a good life and who want to make a difference. And the industry is a wonderful industry, actually. So I was just making up this kind of false reality in my head, and that was a blocker, but actually it was just made up in my head. And the interesting thing is, if there are lots of people who have that kind of same thing, then it just creates that kind of microculture of, well, you know, and then you've got to be all macho and everything yeah. else, and it, and, it, and it feeds itself. Because that's the thing I find is, and I, I've worked in, in advertising, brand, I mean, I've worked in lots of different industries, as have you, is, is one of the block, the, uh, it's just understanding the blockers, that the reality is people are crying out for help yeah. often. And I'm always fascinated what prevents people from crying out for help in, in marketing, media and advertising, from, from, from your experience or maybe from what you've seen in... Stigma. Stigma. Yeah, I think stigma is the thing. You know, I think it's, you know, we talked before, I, talked, I mentioned about we, you know, worrying about coming across as weak. Mm. is a thing that people really struggle with uh, and being 
you know, being judged for it. Uh, and I think that is a thing, you know, our industry has got, it's got a sheen about it. And I think people like to be slick and they like to present themselves in a, in a or have traditionally liked to present themselves in a, in a way that, that doesn't show, you know, weakness. And, and that's been the thing. And I think, I think increasingly that's not a thing. You know, I'm, I will be, I will speak, and I'm not, I'm not alone about like, when I say this, but I think if someone asks me how I am, I'll be, be really open and honest about it. And, and um, I'll be honest, open and honest about my weaknesses as well, because I think that, you know, weaknesses and strengths are two sides of the same coin. And, yeah. and, and, and so I think that's a thing that has always existed, but I think we as an industry are getting much better at destigmatizing difficult conversations around whether it's mental health or, um, you know, racism or um, all of the issues that we've had in, in, in our lives and in society and in our, in our industry for many years. Um, so I think it's quite, you know, it's quite an exciting time actually for that reason. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers the that's, question. That's brilliant. That's yeah. spot on. What, what I'm also, what I've also uh, experienced with you, Josh, working with you on various things, is this thing you talked about earlier about being vulnerable as a lead. I've seen you be vulnerable with your teams and your people as a lead, and, which is incredible. Um, it's one of the key things, I think, that helps leaders unblock the things that they're trying to do, and yet it's still so difficult to do. And I've been in a situation where you want to be vulnerable, but you, vulnerability is quite scary. Yeah. If people want to think about being vulnerable, how do you go about, how do you go about being vulnerable? How do you prepare for being vulnerable? What, what kind of things do you think about that help you be vulnerable for your people to see you as the leader that you want them to see you as? Such a difficult question to answer that. It's a great question, but it really is, it's, you know, I, th I think my, you know, when people say, you know, what's your superpower? People mm. ask that question, what's your yeah, superpower? Yeah. I don't have a superpower, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> You'll have one somewhere. Professionally average. <laughs> and, um, but, I, but I think um, my, I am completely honest. Yeah. You know, that is, if I have a superpower, it's my honesty. Well, it, it is a superpower. A, 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 and, it's, and, I, and I have no fear of being honest. Yeah. And I've always been like that. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, I'm, and I am very honest about myself. And, and I'm... Um, not scared to be honest about myself. And maybe that comes from coming from a loving upbringing or, um, I don't know, maybe a bit of an, ex you know, I get a bit of excitement from, um, oh, I'm going to say this now and I wonder what's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. I, I, I've always, I, I, so. A vulnerability uh, grenade. Almost. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so, you know, and I think, much, there are much braver people out there than me who've done much braver things than just demonstrate that they can, you know, my, my vulnerability, honestly, but the, probably the, the most vulnerable thing that I've ever said to people is I get insomnia um, when I'm anxious and stressed, you know, and, and, and I think the first time I ever said that publicly, I was quite scared about saying it, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Because um, I thought people would think I'd we I was weak. And then as soon as I said it, people went, like people didn't bat an eyelid. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Me you're, too. You're normal, yeah, you're yeah, human. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I think, so that was for me was like, a, okay, that wasn't actually very brave at all. I was just being honest about my, my, my human, the human experience, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, but then I sort of thought, well, it's really important that I share this with people because I'm a leader of quite a big company and that's a company that's quite sort of tough and high performing and it's, you know, we're the biggest agency in the UK and bish bash bosh and so for the ceo of that company to say i get stressed and i i doubt myself all the time and it, i think for people i don't think it's necessarily inspiring for people but it normalizes their human experience mm. and it says oh well if he's feeling that and he seems to be doing okay it's okay to feel yeah. how i feel and, yeah. and maybe you know it's all right to you know we say it's okay not to, to be, be okay yeah and yeah. i think it's it's really important that people understand that they're not alone and that they're, and that they're, it's, it's not like everyone else in the world's fine and I'm on my own in this dark room going, ah, yeah. questioning myself and worrying about the future. And, you know, we all do that. And, and I think, so you, I think as a leader, you have a responsibility to do that and, and, and to demonstrate your vulnerability. It's not just, you know, hey, 
these, this type of leader is, I think all leaders have to do that, yeah. actually, because I think people look to you for guidance and I think people need to see that you're just like them. Well, I love the fact that you, you, you st it's the responsibility of a leader to be vulnerable. It's not a nice to have, it's not a sign of weakness, it's, it's a responsibility. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that. And you, you said there was a moment, obviously, when you, you, you said to the, to the organisation, uh, you're in you know, you, you get insomnia when you're stressed, and that helped galvanise people around. But was there a, was there a was there a moment that you saw aside from that where you knew that the wellness message was getting across that people you know you'd kind of you'd push through the blockers and people were really embracing mental wellness and what you were trying to do. I think um, so. I think that there was a there was a key moment at MediaCom where. Um, well, I'm sort of, I'll, I'll explain it in order of events. So, so when I started to meet at the as CEO of the UK, I, I was um, keen to have a focus on wellness. And so the first thing that I did was I communicated to people. So I'm going to talk for a couple of minutes. That's fine. No, please. The story, yeah, please. But <clears throat> I basically, I, I sort of, in my first speech to the company, I said, look, I want everybody to work flexibly. I, I, I want people to feel like they can work where they want the hours that they want, or you know, the contracted hours that they want, but yeah. whatever hours in the day those you guys want to work. Because I think it's really important for me that you, um, that your life and your work complement each other and that you're able to work the way that you want to work. So be where you want to be geographically, work the hours that you want to work to fit in with your lifestyle, do it in unison with your team so that you're not like, you haven't just suddenly disappeared because we're in a people business. But, but, you know, I want you to do that. Um, but the one ask I have of you is don't email each other after seven o'clock at night or in the weekends. Right. Now, I know that not everybody agrees with this strategy, but for me, I feel it's really important that people have headspace yeah. and, that, and that we're able to switch off. And that comes from my insomnia, knowing that if I, if I don't read an email after seven o'clock at night, uh, I sleep better. It's as simple as that. Right, yeah. yeah? But... Um, it's harder to do now in my, in my new job because I'm global COO and so I'm working with loads of different time, time zones. And, but I think if you're in a, in a market, I felt really strongly. So I communicated that message and that was all about wellness. And, 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 I, enc and I encouraged other things, including, you know, having you come and do some stuff with yep. us um, around, um, you know, just around mindfulness and well-being and, you know, meditation and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so I communicated what was, what was important to me as a leader, and I think that's an important thing for leaders to do. We then, we, we do various different inclusion events at, at Mediacom and have done for years. And we had um, Johnny and Neil come in and talk about um, the documentary that they'd done, which is, um, I think it's called Man on the Bridge, and it's the story, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, people know about it. It's the story about um, Johnny was... Um, basically had woken up and decided that he was going to kill himself that yeah. day. And Neil, who's a personal trainer, didn't know him, came across him on London Bridge, talked him off the bridge. They didn't see each other for ages. Then they got reunited. And the whole program was about Johnny trying to find Neil. It's a anyway, brilliant program. Amazing program. <laughs> and they came and spoke at, um, at the agency. And, and um, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. And so the penny dropped with me that mental health is really a very, very important thing here. And it's not just about well-being it's about mental health actually and so so we went on a whole you know we we, we um myself and um, our head of dni nancy langthorne um uh were very focused on what can we do to build a mental health program at mediacom that is true to the culture of mediacom and that um <clears throat> empowers our people because it can't just be it, it sh it's good to have a figurehead saying this is really important but you also you know, it can't just be a top-down thing. It has to be uh, generated by the people for the people, in my view. We yeah. can talk about that a little bit more. But so, so, so we had a mental health ally program, and it was a self-selecting thing. Lots of people who, who wanted to be mental health allies in the company uh, joined up, got trained, and so on and so forth. One of the initiatives that we had that was established by the mental health allies, I would love to say it was my idea, but it wasn't, <laughs> um, but um, was a thing called My Mental Health Story. Ah, OK. And this was, um, this was basically an initiative in Mental Health Awareness Week about four years ago where a handful of people told their story on an email. So 
each person, they wrote a whole story, their mental health story, on an email and sent it out to the whole company. And in the UK, we've got, I think, about 1,400 people working in wow. the UK. And they, they sent, with their name on it, wow. their personal mental health story to the company. Yeah? That's incredible. And, um, which is incredibly brave of those people. And I think that moment where the first email went out was a transformative moment in the culture of Mediacom UK. Mm. Because you couldn't have heard a pin drop in the... I mean, you sorry, you could have heard a pin drop <laughs> yeah. in the office when that email got sent out. Everybody read the email and they were moved by it. And they communicated with the person who sent it and said, you know, either well done, so brave, or, you know, actually that story really resonated with me. I've had a similar experience or someone I know has had a similar experience. Or whatever it was, it broke down the walls and it created the conversation and it opened up the conversation and it normalized it and it destigmatized it and it changed the culture of the business you know and actually that um that was an incredible thing and it was a brave thing and it could have gone wrong but it went right and it's built momentum and we do it every year now but we also do it around pride so people yeah. do a pride story black history month my black history story and it's uh, it really opens up dialogue and i think that you know if you talk about what was the thing that for me was the moment. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, and I remember it really well, it was incredible. And I mean, it, it, I often say, I often say when I'm working with people, like the, the biggest changes just come from having the conversations. They all start with the right conversation. And yeah, I mean, having those mental health conversations in business, you know, I, I'm seeing it now more and more, but that story, and I remember actually you telling, telling me about that a, a while ago, and, and that was like one of the first times I'd heard organisation wide, you know, people sharing that kind of, and almost like, not a cry for help, but the opportunity to share a story yeah. and get the help that they need, um, which, you know, now people need to learn from and look at, look at what they're doing in their own organisations to do that. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think something else that we did um, consciously yeah. was. Um, to really promote those people, not I don't mean necessarily promote not them prom to yeah, the next job, yeah, yeah. although we did good. as yeah, well, good. honestly. Good. Yeah. Um, but I mean, put them front and centre of everything. You know, put them front and centre of events. You know, our men's worth allies, they have green lanyards for their security passes. They can be identified very easily in the company so that people can talk to them if they, if they need to talk to somebody. But those people are very much front and centre of all of the events that we do. Um, and we genuinely promote the people who are, we, we talk, you know, we encourage them to tell their story, not just on an email form, but on the stage. And we, you know, and I think it's an, that is a, you know, what we're, what we're, what we're intrinsically or implicitly communicating there is that they're heroes. Yeah, these people. Yeah, and um, but it's it's cool. And outside of those heroes, you know, when we're, when we're so we think about unlocking stuff now, we're always trying to be inspired and think about what's next and who can we learn from, who can you learn from, who do you be, who are you inspired by when thinking about mental wellness and mental health? What 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 inspires you to keep making change, and what do you draw on to help you think about what you need to keep doing? in Mediacom globally as well as just, you know, what you're doing at the moment as well in the UK? I mean, I think that we see... Uh, th th honestly, I, I'm inspired a lot by... Um, I, I, this isn't about age, but I think I'm, I'm inspired a lot by people um, um, who are in more junior positions than me, who I learn from all the time. You know, I mean, I'm... I constantly find myself talking to people and going, there's no way I could have done this when I was at your level yeah. of business, you know? Yeah. And so I'm massively inspired by, you know, not younger people, but people who, who come with a fresh perspective yeah. uh, on things. Um, those are the people that I learn from the most. Um, my children are hugely inspiring. You yeah. know, I... I, I when I look at, when I hear what they've got to say, the way that they see the world, the way that they tear me, that you know, literally can tear <laughs> me to pieces just easily, you know, and, and um, see through my um, BS yeah. um, and just keep me honest, 
So I'm inspired by that. I'm very inspired by my wife, honestly, yeah. who's um, just, I don't know, just think she's incredible. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Like, so those are people who are close to me that I'm inspired by. Um, you know, I'm inspired by leaders who are, who are willing to show that they're not perfect, I think. Mm. People, who, people who are willing to say, I, I made a mistake here. Right. You know, I don't think we see that enough in leaders. No. People who go, I've, I cocked that one up. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I need to, I just want to say that was my fault. Yeah. You just don't see it. And so I'm inspired by people like that as well. Brilliant. And you're, I guess one of the, the key things about unlocking this sort of stuff uh, at every level, but, but certainly I, I guess people watching uh, this evening as well, thinking about how do I do something similar in my business, uh, is often trying to unlock stakeholders and trying to get buy-in at senior level, uh, sometimes with people who, like we talked about earlier, who are so embedded in the culture. I'm not saying this is true of your business, by the way, yeah. but just in business general, they're so embedded in that culture, so wedded to that culture, mm. that mental wellness, any kind of wellness outside of their reality yeah. is, sorry, it's way down a list of priorities. Yeah. We've, got, you know, we've got shareholders to deal with, we've got things to do. How do, you get, how do you go about getting stakeholders bought into something that so feels quite intangible but it's fundamentally like critical to business performance like you've, you've no a brilliant question i listen i think it's um you well i'll tell you fr from a personal experience our focus on i can't say i can't say our focus on mental health and well-being was the reason for our um success but the four years from start to uh you know mental health you know our focus on mental health onwards and our focus on this was the most successful period in our company's history. Wow. Yeah. Well, there you go. And, and I'm not saying that the, you know, that was down to a lot of things. Yeah. But creating a culture of a business, and that, that's why some of this is intangible, as you say, but creating a culture in a business where people can genuinely be themselves and don't feel like they have to put something on um, brings out the best in people. You know, you thrive if you are working in a place where you can be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And where you don't feel like you're going to be judged and you can break down in tears if you need to break down in tears or, um, you know, and I think that that I think that that is um, I think that leaders are starting to see that. And I think COVID has been good for that. Yeah. So I think you're st I'm starting to see leaders who would never have spoken about mental health before talking about mental health. Yeah. Um, and that's a great thing. What I worry about is that in two years time, they won't be talking about it anymore. Yeah. And I think that's the, you know, I think people who are interested in this and want to have, want to see change in their companies have a responsibility for driving that change. Yeah. Um, you know, and using companies like us, like Lloyd's, who have also been really focused on mental health, yeah. many other companies, yeah. as examples of, of, of businesses that are focused on it and, and seen business success as a result of it. Um, I think they have a, 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 a responsibility to um, work with their leaders on, on, on creating a program around mental health. The second thing I would say is it's really important that, you know, something that we did at Mediacom isn't necessarily exactly the same as, doesn't mean that that, that program in itself would necessarily be exactly right for another type of company. Yeah. Because you have to be true to the culture of that company. You have to establish something that is true to that company. Yeah, and I think, so I think that's another thing. The third thing is, um, by the people for the people. Yeah. You know, empower, uh, enlist people who want, to ha who want to drive change in a company. They are going to be your strongest advocates. They're going to be your strongest leaders of the future. And it's, you know, people want to be empowered. People want to have the opportunity to make where they work a better place. So, give, you know, give them it. Give them it, because that will have the strongest impact on, it, on the business. That's brilliant. Because the thing I wanted to pick up on is, I think you're absolutely right about, there are leaders talking about it now, and the concern is that they, don't talk, they won't be talking about it in two years. I mean, I have an even bigger concern as well on top of that, which is people are still talking about it and actually not doing anything about it. Yeah. So my big thing is, you know, when we talk about unleashing stuff, is what I love about the work that you've been doing is it's not about just the talk, it's not about just saying we're going to do something. It's about actually physically creating stuff and doing things and rolling things out. And I love the concept of 
for the people, by the people. Because if it, uh, quite often, if people do want to do something, but their perspective and their reality means that they can't do something, i.e. they're just not close enough to it, it doesn't mean enough to them to do it, but they give people permission to go out and yeah. start doing it, then that for me is an incredible, at least... I agree with that, I right agree with that, but I think there actually has to be someone at the top of the organisation saying, this is important, yeah. and I'm getting behind this, and I'm investing in this, yeah. you know, financially. Yeah. <clears throat> I also believe... Uh, and I do, by the way, I don't know how to do this, but I, I want to do this, and I want people to help me do this, but I believe that companies should be accountable for mm, yeah. their men the mental health wellness programs that they put in place in their companies, in, right. in, in their businesses, and have a responsibility for their people. And I would like to see some way of measuring or reporting you know, maybe measuring is the wrong word, but reporting how companies are looking after the well-being and the mental health of the people that work for them. Yeah. And I'd like to see that in the UK, um, you know, happen soon. I'd like that to be debated in Parliament mm. in 2022. Um, and I don't, as I say, I don't know how to, how to make that happen, but I think it's a really important thing to happen. Well, I think... I. Uh, who knows what's going to happen uh, the, uh, of what we're going through at the moment and and actually not even just the pandemic but I think what also is happening we are undergoing sort of a, a serious number of changes at every level uh, even before Covid we were talking about young children having the equivalent of PTSD over climate change and being terrified of climate change it was the same when I was a kid we used to have fear of nuclear war and yeah you know, and so it's not only is it happening in the workplace, but we're also, for good or for bad, we're recognising it early. But, you know, I think in the old days, you know, the, the nuclear war, get over it, son, it's not going to happen and you just deal with it. Whereas now we're, we are categorising and identifying mental wellness at all stages in people's lives, which is ultimately a good thing, I think, as long as we can do something about it, like you say, and measure it and help make people's lives better and, and i think it's an interesting that there's a focus definitely on the uk and you've got a global remit yeah. really and everything we've talked about here it hasn't just been through a uk lens but predominantly has been in the uk where is the rest of the world from your experience in mental wellness in in organizations so behind right i would say um and so i took on the i took on the job of ceo for the europe middle east and africa this time last year and um one of the first things that I said to my team um, was, my, you know, my central team was, I want to take the mental health stuff that we've done in, in the UK out to other markets. Yeah. And I was told, yeah, it's not so relevant. And I was like, well, how can it, how can it not be relevant? You know, it's, we, we all have mental health, yeah. you know, yeah. and, we move, and we move up and down kind of the scale constantly. Yeah, absolutely. So how can it not be, how can mental health be relevant in the UK but not in other <laughs> markets? I don't understand. <laughs> And they were like, well, it's just, I'm not saying it's not relevant, but it's not something you should necessarily talk about, you know. So I said, uh, so, okay, fine. Anyway, then I went off to start visiting markets and, and I talk about lots of different things with the markets. But when I talked about the mental health there, stuff, that was the thing that people really wanted to talk about. Ah, okay. And, and um, particularly in the markets where I was told it was least relevant. Ah, okay. So um, a year down the line, I've now got a global role as well as doing the, the European role. And... And we are, I'm now working with our um, chief people officer, um, global chief people officer, on a um, global mental health uh, program. And what I mean by that is developing resources for all of our local markets to be able to use, um, developing mental health ally training for the whole world. So, uh, you know, we're investing in that. And so, so every market can have mental health allies in their market. Wow. Um, um, global resources for people to tap into. Um, you know, we utilise different um, companies, we work with different companies, we work with a company called Mental Health at Work who teach mental health, for the mental health allies, so they teach you the kind of basics on mental health and they teach you how to ask open questions so that you can have a good conversation with somebody and break down barriers. Yep. Uh, we also, um, in the UK, we're using Unmind um, as an app, which is a fantastic app that, um, that um, 
uh, is, a, is a great resource for our people around um, all sorts of different things around mental health. And they're, they're a global company, so we could potentially work with them globally. We're looking at you know, other types of partners that we can work with. Um, we also, again, in the UK, um, support our people if they need um, kind of professional help. So if they, if they have a, a, an issue that's something that can't be resolved within the company, they actually need kind of you know, therapy or, or, yep. or, or treatment of some description. Um, and um, you know, we're looking at what we can do, how we can expand that out um, globally. And um, we've also done, you know, we haven't really talked about that much um, in this conversation, but in the UK, we've done quite a lot of resilience work, particularly around, and resilience is probably the wrong word, but we talked earlier about the idea of understanding the relationship between thought and feelings yes. and, and, and how that impacts your experience. You know, having real insight around that is an incredibly powerful tool. For me, it was actually quite transformative for, for my whole life. I, and I was I was given coaching to, to, to understand that. It's kind of NLP coaching, isn't well, it? Well, it's or more it? about it's just understanding the it's just understanding ultimately. It's about how, being able to gain perspective. Yeah, really, it's about perspective. And I've introduced the person that I've learned from to various people in the UK, but also now in um, a few other markets as well. And so I'm looking at how we can expand that across the world as well. So lots of stuff. Great. And I mean, it's, you know, it goes to show, uh, and I often talk about this when I talk, when I talk with businesses, it, it goes to show that the, the businesses that are really getting behind things, that are really creating the future and, and get behind something like, like mental wellness or whatever it might be from a business perspective, when you open it up, there's loads, there is loads of opportunities, loads of things you can do. And suddenly, like you're saying, you know, global partnerships, um, measurement, help, mental health allies, all these, suddenly you, you realise how much there is out there to do. Yeah. And then you suddenly realise the gulf between businesses that are really getting behind this and those that aren't. Yeah. Those that somebody going into work and is, or, or not even going into work physically anymore, but is on a Zoom call really I, you know, maybe suffering, you know, struggling with mental, mental health issues. And you suddenly realise the gulf between working for businesses that really care and those that really don't. Mm. And you know, I, find that, I find that quite, you know, quite alarming. Having been, you know, having, having been in the you know, very early stage of my career, almost having a, a kind of a serious like, burnout, but then having a wonderful, wonderful woman in HR who was just incredible and way ahead of her time in terms of giving me help and the support that I needed. And this was 25 years ago. But I, 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 I really, and, and I feel that pain quite viscerally when I think about people now mm. going through something like that. And there is all this help out there now, mm. more so than there was. And there are people like you doing this progressive stuff and it's still not... Yeah, I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, I hope that will change. I think that... Um, you know, I've been very lucky because I've been given the freedom to do this in my company uh, yeah. and I'm very grateful to um, my bosses uh, within Mediacom and within WPP who celebrate and, uh, and encourage uh, the stuff that I've done. Um, when I talk to, you know, we have, obviously this is just, we're talking about this particular subject, but actually, you know, the day job is about advertising and media and marketing yeah. and, you know, we have some of the best, most um, creative clients in the world, you know, yeah. that we work with. And what I love is that when we talk, when I talk to clients about this, they really lean into it and they really want to hear what we do. And some of them have had me come and talk to them at their, and their really? teams. And what can they take from it? Equally, the partners that we work with, media owner partners that we work with. I, I often get like an email, I'll, I'll get emails from partners saying, I won't tell you who or what, but they'll say, I've got this problem with this, with, you know, with a staff member. Yeah. What would you do? Wow. You know, and I'll say, well, this is what I did. And this is how we do it. And this one. And, um, I'm so honoured that people would ask me, because so, there's, there's such there's nothing more important. Yeah, yeah, no, completely, yeah. And, um, and so what I think that demonstrates is, 
And by the way, I don't know what I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I'm wigging, I'm winging it. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. No, no, but it's based on your experience of doing all this, all this stuff. You know, though, I'm right? not a mental health professional or anything no. like that. I, but um, what that tells me is that there is a huge appetite for um, a much more open, progressive working culture now and in the future, which makes me feel very positive about the future and. It, you know, we were talking earlier about fear. Like, I, I'm not scared about saying anything now mm. because you can see, I can see that it resonates with people. Yeah. In the same way that when Johnny and Neil came and told their story at Mediacom, it resonated with all our people there. Yeah. So um, any business that doesn't take it seriously needs to take a you know, cold look at themselves, really. I guess they, they need to before people in, in their own organisation start doing exactly. it for them. I'm just looking at this, uh, this tablet here because we've got questions from the audience. So if you do have any questions for Josh, we're going to spend a little bit of time. Uh, what you've heard today, you know, some wonderful stories, some interesting, brilliant anecdotes. And the whole purpose of this is that you, know, you get something out of it as well that you can take away and action unleash in your business should you need to. So. Um, Josh, we've got a, a question here. How do you maintain your mental wellness? Yeah, good question. Um, so I, um, any, so the, the, so the short answer is anything that enables me to gain perspective. Um, and that is, for me, the kind of perspective is, really the, the, the sort of, um, what's the word? The magic ingredient to life. You know, I think if you can, if you can sort of pull yourself away from the problems in your, at the front of your head that are going and gain perspective, then you can, you, you can find happiness and you, or you can find peace. Yeah. Maybe it's not happiness, it's peace. And I think that, so, so what are the things that I do? You know, maybe that's less interesting, actually. What do I do? I, do, I did yoga this morning. Yeah, oh, great. Um, and I, you know, I like to do sport and exercise. I, um, I don't look at, well, I'm, saying, I'm saying this like I'm some sort of Buddhist monk. It's not true at all. But when I'm, when I'm best, I'm present. Yeah. So... I, my phone is not with me. You know, when I'm with my kids, I'm just focusing on my kids. Yeah. Um, do I do that all the time? No. My kids would be the first to tell you that I don't. But those are the things. If I, if, I'm, if I allow myself to be present and allow myself to gain perspective by doing the things that, that en enable that perspective, I hope I'm being clear when I say this, then I get peace and it gives me well-being. Mm. Um, everyone has different things that they need to do to make that happen and that but I think it is that it's the but how do you gain perspective but equally you know I I um you know being really honest I I I've had some I've had some over the last couple of months I've been giving oxygen to unhelpful thinking mm. um around certain things that have made me feel you know just a bit foggy headed not I wouldn't go I wouldn't say it necessarily full-on depression but just you know not not clear thinking yeah. and i've um so i've gone and spoken to the coach who who's taught who taught me before about understanding the relationship between thought and feelings yeah i went and spoke to her for two hours and that unblocked that yeah just being able to so i was i'm very fortunate to have that yes um uh, and that person that i can go and talk to you can remind me yeah just remind me about how to gain perspective and remind me about and it's 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 not intellectually complicated it's more it but it but she can help me kind of just clear my head i i i have very similar kind of thinking to that in in that respect i mean i i operate very well if i'm in, in routine and i don't mean kind of uh you know doing the same thing every day but i know that my mental health is strong if i exercise first thing in the morning I do the, the the hard stuff that I need to do do my deep work in the morning straight after I've, I've done the workout and then in the afternoon 
I allow some time for, and sometimes people, people say, well, you're just kind of wasting time. I might play a computer game or do something. But actually, I know that that's, that's time for my brain just to go click, 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 and just to get very, very calm. And then spending time with my, my kids in the evening as well is, is massively important. And on that thing about how do you, when, when, when these feelings and thoughts arise, uh, how do you deal with it? I, I, somebody gave me this wonderful quote, I think it's by Rumi, the, the kind of philosopher, which was, worrying about tomorrow takes the power from today. And exactly I, think right. it's, it's, I think it's one of the most incredible, and it's, it's the thing that I go back to. And I'm sitting there and I, you know, you're going, oh, and I'm thinking, I'm worrying about tomorrow and I'm losing the power from today. Yeah. And actually, that just helps me take a step forward and go, right, I'm gonna do some, I'm gonna create some action. Yeah. Because if it's preparing for something, or it's writing the questions I need to ask, or it's doing something, it stops the worry. Because you're taking a, a, a logical, powerful step forward yeah. in moving towards what it is that you wanna do. Um, we've, got, we've got a couple of minutes left, uh, uh, Josh, and another question that's come in is really like, how do you uh, keep momentum? How do you keep things moving forward and stick to the plan? And how do you, how do, you do that personally? What are the, the things that you've got that help you? I mean, I think, um, it, do you mean the plan in terms of um, mental health program or do you mean in terms of just keeping momentum because going for myself? Keeping momentum as, as a leader, yeah. I think you have to be um, motivated to do something. Yeah. Like, I, think, I think as soon as you lose your interest or your motivation to achieve something, you kind of, it falls flat. Yeah. So I think you need to, I, my personal, I'm always kind of, I always find goals, even if they're like tiny little goals, I'll always be identifying goals or, you know, or going, how can I help make this happen? Like, how can I, like, I, I work with such clever people. <laughs> it's terrifying, yeah, there are, yeah, you know, and I'm like, oh God, these people are so much cleverer than me. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm more constantly thinking, how can I add value to their lives? Yeah. How can I make, the, how can I help them? Yeah. Um, and that's what keeps me going, honestly. Um, so that's probably how I keep myself um, sort of motivated and hopefully helpful in some way. But um, I don't know if that answers the question. But. It does. I'm sure it does. Oh, it, it has been, it's been everything that I, I, I really wanted it to be for people to hear today, Josh. So thank you ever so much for coming in. Cause I just pleasure. Think, you know, the world is changing so rapidly. The world of work is changing incredibly rapidly and the moment that we lose sight of what's really important this human element how we look after our people look after each other and keep mental wellness at the forefront which is what you've been doing for a long time at mediacom and setting the bar um, then i think that those businesses are going to really suffer uh, and we want people to thrive and change and grow and i think that's exactly what you're doing at mediacom i hope so I and hope so, yeah. <laughs> so a massive thank you for, to Josh for coming in this evening and sharing all that with us. Hope you had your questions answered. And if you've got any other questions, clearly, uh, please do uh, send them in to me and send them in here and we'll, we'll get them answered for you. And, and, and keep coming back to Restore this week. There are loads of fantastic things, all of which are there to help you be more healthy, thrive and look after your mental wellness. Once again, thanks to Josh for coming in this evening. Thank you. My name's Scott Morrison from The Boom. I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening, wherever you're watching this, and most of all, stay boom.